Nothing stops the traffic like this. And it's the, it's the double threat. It looks like it's got a tuxedo on and it's not gonna hurt anybody until you start it. And then it's your worst nightmare if you're gonna race against it. It's really a monster with a tuxedo on. It really is. I can't think of anything I would have changed on this particular car. It was a pleasure to build. There was no limits. And I would say it's probably one of the best cars I've ever built. I'll never forget the day you dropped this off. I went, this is what we're cutting up? I was expecting a crappier car. And when I made a comment, I'll never forget you saying, well, if I give you a better car, we get a better car when we're done. Yes, sir. And then we proceeded to gut this beautiful car. When the kit came to the shop and we began to put it up to the car, there was a few moments of, of despair, let's say. I've been involved from day one with all of it. In fact, we have videos of this car with all the stuff on it when we first got it. And it was horrible and hideous and none of it fit. The body lines didn't fit. Most of these parts looked like they were used, trimmed, and rejected and sent to a junk pile, and then they sent it all to us. When we laid it all out on the floor, we were like, wow, this is horrible. But as we began to hack it up and chop it and you know cut it down, it became pretty evident of what we were going to do. In my opinion, that's probably what spurred this beautiful car because I remember thinking it's going to take us three months to fix all this and make it look like Eleanor and for the same time frame and effort we can make it different and next level and I believe the term I used was make it Eleanor's evil sister. There's only about 40 percent of the original kit still on the car. Most of it was cut up or hand fabricated. We're not scared to cut or hack or change or modify at all. That's what we do. The side opening hood is a very interesting thing because, first of all, nobody had one until we did this one. And now I'm seeing them here and there. And, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, so I like it. But uh, the deal was, and I have to get total credit to the owner, who in the early stages of discussing what we were gonna do, said this to me. When I go into a car show and there's 10 Eleanors lined up, I wanna know which one's mine from across the yard. He said that. Thought, well, how would you do that? And so I just got a vision in my head, all these hoods like this. I thought this one should be like that. And that was the beginning of the out of the boxness of this car. That was like the first thing I went, oh, this is going to be cool. We're really not doing like everybody else. We're not making Eleanor. We're making something very different. The side opening hood was a nightmare. I would say we probably built five or six different hinge systems and then the action of the whole hood was kind of awkward, but I'm glad we did what we did. It, uh, it turned out really cool and has become kind of a trademark of Henry's Hot Rods. There is so much going on in the nose of this car. Once again, it looks like a Mustang and there's just headlights there, but there isn't. For example, there's a one gallon oil filter behind this headlight. There's a six gallon tank behind the other headlight. There is a computer right here that runs the cooling system. There is eight lights in this car. There, all, all of this I'm describing is between here and here. Because everybody's concept of, say, radical is different. Or everybody's concept of, of, you know, I just want a mild cam is totally different. So you really have to see where the person's coming from and what they want out of the car. And then you have to formulate that in your engine design. The engine, as you can see, looks like it doesn't even fit under the hood. It has less than a quarter of an inch of clearance between it and the scavenger plate that collects the four stages of oil that go back into that tank through an Aviard four-stage pump that's built, driven off the crank, which we also had to modify the frame to make clearance for the drive for the pump. A custom-built motor is built to the car and to the person who's driving it and how they're going to drive it. So you can generically put a crate motor together and it might get close. You know, let's say you're investing $10,000 in a crate motor and you can invest $2,000 or $4,000 more and get something that really sings for what you want it to do to meet the, 
the investment's a no-brainer. The biggest misconception about this car, that this is a dressed up Mustang and it's a show car. First, it's not a Mustang, it just looks like one. Second, it looks so nice, everybody assumes it's not usable. On the contrary, I have personally beat on this car at Good Guys events six times. And every time I pull up, it goes, oh my God, you're not gonna beat on that, are you? Why, yes I am. You can beat the crap out of this thing and you're not, it's not gonna overheat, it's not gonna break. It's got the best everything in it. You know, back in the 60s when they were doing things, cylinder head technology and cam technology wasn't near what it is now. So back in those days, 600 horsepower was considered crazy full race. I mean, that was doing something. Whereas your motor is way past that and it, you can basically drive it on the street. And a lot of that is the head design and the cam technology and, and the dry sump and the oiling to make sure that it stays reliable and all that. So all these different systems have really come a long way in their evolution in order to be able to do this. With the big motor and the, the width of the Mustang, there wasn't a whole lot of room. So in the very beginning, we knew that that was going to be an issue and then went to the dry sump system. And uh, it's kind of reminiscent of the old 70s and 80s uh, drag boats uh, where they had to set the motor down low. So that's kind of where that came from. When we first started talking about this and what we were gonna put in this car, it seemed pretty obvious that you were gonna put way more power in this car than this car could handle, that a unibody structure could deal with. And uh, so from the get-go, we stepped up and put the right thing under it, which is a double chassis Morrison frame. And by giving them all the information up front when it was delivered to us, it fit perfectly. The components all come with the Art Morrison chassis. And so all the engineering and the hard work as far as positioning and angling and, and stuff like that has already been done for you when it del is delivered. The Art Morrison frame, as wonderful as it is, they don't know what you're gonna do with it, with every little nook and cranny and what hardware you're gonna put in it and whatever. And obviously this car is a one-off deal and even with their custom frame that we ordered and they built exactly the way we wanted, there's still things we needed to change to suit our project. And one of the most important things was where the exhaust goes through the frame in various places. So I sectioned it and put two crossovers through the frame where it needed it. So this exhaust out the side is real, for real. And it goes straight through the car. There's no funny bend around anything. It's perfect. I decided to channel that car because that's a preference of mine. I like them low, lean, and mean, brother. Air ride system itself was great. It didn't require any fab or modification whatsoever to put it in the car. The only thing that happened, and this is like a reincurring theme with this car, is there's so much in this car, it's hard to hide it or put it where you don't see it. And so none of the air ride lines are exposed on the bottom. None of the wiring is exposed on the bottom. If you put the car up in the air, there's no wiring whatsoever under the car. You can't, it's all just the emergency brake cable is the only thing. Extra training is on the bottom of that car. So that carries through with everything. One thing I did with my 640 horsepower race car, I drove it down the street one day and I realized there's no way I could full throttle that car down a busy street. Things happen just way too fast. That car accelerates way too quickly. So in that aspect, you know, 700 horsepower is a handful. So you have another 300 horsepower or potentially even more but we would have to really change the piston design. And part of what we're doing with this motor is that it was, you know, kind of more street orientated and you do the car show. So I didn't want to put a, a piston that had a, too much clearance in it that would handle 500 horsepower shot of nitrous because it wouldn't work with what you were trying to do with the car. The man hours in this car, I would guess to be around 6,000 man hours. And most of that was manual labor just sanding and blocking and fitting. And I've had that hood on and off probably 25 times. This is a handmade car. It's not a Mustang that's painted. There's nothing about this car that's normal. And I could sit here for six days and tell you everything that's handmade from this frame has been bobbed and shortened because all this wouldn't fit in the front as we were talking about before and required some drastic engineering just to get it to fit. And all this is hung off the bottom of the frame, not on top of the frame like everybody else's because you couldn't put enough radiator in this thing. You did it like everybody else. 
There's cutting edge design under this skin all over the place. Hot rods you fit it on, you take it off, you put it back on and, and the fitting is probably the hardest part of a build like this because you know Ford spent millions of dollars to engineer that hood to open that way and us little monkeys went in there and, and, and made it go the opposite way. Things that we hand fitted to this car, other people said didn't fit this car. That was one of our problems, which was all a bunch of hooey. Um, like the overhead console, they said they couldn't fit it in with the roll cage when we already had it all in the car and I already put the brackets on the roof, so I had to disassemble some of the car and reassemble the car with things in place. We had to cut the factory type console down four inches because the car is four inches thinner. So nothing that fits between the floor and the dash will fit. The air conditioning doesn't fit, had to be custom, the firewall, everything about it. The headers are all custom for this car because nothing fits it because it's not a Mustang. It looks like one, but nothing fits it. Our typical build like this, if you, if you put all the aspects, the phone calls, the research, planning a certain part, you know, whatever you're doing, it's a good 60 to 80 hours involved in the, in the actual motor. Put it to you this way, just the assembly time takes me all week. I would say average I get 30 to 40 hours just assembling the motor, blueprinting and assembling the motor, which is the most critical part of, of the whole process. This thing was planned from day one, and it evolved and certain things changed, but nothing was compromised for anything. And so I'm comparing it to normal cars I've done that you get somebody half built the car and now I'm finishing, now I have to reintegrate things that don't go with each other. This thing was planned from day one. We knew what we were doing, so we didn't ever have to go backwards. We dealt with every challenge as it came to us. And we designed or made or whatever overcame it and moved on to the next one knowing what was coming. We were never blindsided in this process. 30 years ago, we didn't have this availability. So, you know, it's wonderful to be able to buy a unit that'll do what you want it to do, have your overdrive, because it really makes two cars out of one. With that overdrive, you can drive to LA if you wanted this. It might be a little expensive on the gas, but, <laughs> but the point is that you're only going to be turning two grand or 2100 going down the freeway at 75 miles an hour. So it's just, you know, when we were kids, it was 3,500. <laughs> so you were kind of stuck around town if you had a hot rod. People like Gene Winfield have walked up to me and said, man, this is the deal. Chip Foos, Chip Foos's dad, George Barris, I mean, the heroes of my life have drooled on the car that I built. I'm sorry, that's it. That's, that's as good as it gets. This car it presents itself in such an elegance that you can just look at it and, and be content. I, I've never experienced anything, and, and that's the truth. I mean, I've never experienced a car like this. What you did with the design, the color, the theme, it, you just nailed it, Scott. So, beautiful car, and very proud to be a part of it. Absolutely very proud to be a part of it.